Welcome to this week's Cattle Call. I'm Susan Littlefield on the Rural Radio Network. We're actually doing this from the Junior High State Rodeo Finals that are taking place in Albion, Nebraska. So when Brad came on camera and I saw his cowboy hat, I thought, how appropriate. But I think it kind of fits what we're going to be talking about today when it comes to this cattle market. As really is cash in the producer's pocket in their corner. We're going to talk more about what cash is like this week, what box beef has been like, and demand. I kind of want to say the proof is in the pudding, or maybe we should say the proof is in the, you know, ribeye steaks that you're eating. We're going to talk more about what is going on with this market. As I mentioned, Brad Coima, he's with Coima, Coima and Varlick out of Sioux Center, Iowa. So let's talk about this cash, because it seems like at this point, you know, the producers, as I was reading some earlier morning stuff, they were saying, you know, the producers were the ones that were saying, nope, we're holding out for more money. What, what you're talking about first, thanks for having me on. Nice to be back on, on a Friday and on a monster up day. Um, I'm glad you had a good time on your little trip. The, um, I think the word we're looking for here is the leverage. Okay. Uh, and, and that would be when, uh, you know, I've said this over and over, uh, you know, there's a very, very fine line between too many and not enough. And, uh, you know, to, 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 to walk that boundary, um, if you could figure that out, you know what, you and I wouldn't need to be doing this stuff. We just open up on, on Fridays and go to the bank, but it sure seems to me like the leverage has swung back this way. Of course, today's the day that one of the majors, uh, had a, had a, uh, took a holiday, right? <clears throat> no kill. Um, uh, and uh, I, I find it interesting. Uh, this is also a week where I should have done the exact math, but I don't know. We're up about $18 on the box beef since the last time you and I talked. Um, really a nice thing to see that big uptick in the, in the, in the, in the beef. Um, and, and it, yeah, people are saying, well, why, you know, isn't there's some, there's some seasonal stuff that cash markets top in this window, you know, I mean, and, and I'm not feeling that way, but uh, there is some, you know, talk about that, but I think maybe just a minute here to talk about how the box beef market maybe sometimes works too. Uh, so box beef, <clears throat> it isn't all sold today for tomorrow's delivery. In fact, very little of it's done that way. You know, a lot of it's sold for two weeks out, a month out. There's, there's meat sold three weeks out. They tell me that like there's some entities like cruise ships and those sorts of things. They'll buy an entire meat's worth or lock in an entire year's worth of beef. Um, so if you look at, you know, the uncertainty that the markets had here again the last while with the bird flu story, um, you know, they read the newspapers, too. I wondered if maybe that retailer and that wholesaler maybe thought, well, we better be careful and not have too much out in front. Right. Have too much commitment on, on stuff up front. Um and got closer to the knife, we would say in our business, um, <clears throat> only to find out that Mother's Day was a tremendous movement, beef movement weekend. And then now you've got a uh, like a number 10 rated weather weekend on the East Coast. There's actually a, somebody I talked to that rates the weather on a one to 10 scale. I don't know. You know, better the weather, the better the demand is usually is the feeling this time of year. So, you know, he he put a 10 on with the East Coast for weather for this weekend. So, you know, we may come plowing back in here next week and find out we've got a bunch of reorder business here after another good uh, a weekend of box movement. I, that's what I'm thinking. <clears throat> I'm not a demand bear at all. You know, I, I find it interesting because, you know, if we rewound this conversation that we had three, four weeks ago, we were talking about consumer confidence. And you had said, let's get into Mother's Day. Let's see what happens. And obviously it's now officially grilling season. And I think they've taken that information that's been in the mainstream media, the, the headline chasers, and just said, nope, we're still going to eat beef and roll off the grill because we now know how to cook it. I, I like that comment. <clears throat> and I, I guess I would also give you the disclaimer of I don't want to sit here and say, okay, you don't have to worry about bird flu anymore because that, that that's not how I feel. But <clears throat> I was encouraged this week. There was uh, like two days in a row where it seemed like all of a sudden the national news re-picked this whole story back up. And I was hearing some of the same, exactly nearly word for word of the same stories that came out two and three weeks ago. And I'm going like, seriously. Um, but now like yesterday, there was a, uh, I don't know, I, I read, I read it three different places, but even the CDC uh, came out with a little different narrative, I thought. And, and that was that, you know what, uh, even if there would happen to be something in in hamburger, if you cook it to 145, it's safe. 
Our meat is safe. It's safe as long as you cook it properly. Uh, you know, different uses of that sort of phrase, not this, well, we're testing and we're going to keep doing this and that. And, and, and they haven't found any workers with any more symptoms or anything like that either, you know. So, you know, maybe the market <clears throat> is breathing just a little easier until whatever the next event is that we seem like we always have to deal with with cattle. You brought up 2014 and we're doing some comparison to that before we went on this program. And I wanted to kind of expand a little bit more on that. If you would. When I, that's when I ordered this custom made hat. Thought I was hot stuff, right? You know, uh, <laughs> whatever. I'm not, you know, you, you get this business will keep you humble. <clears throat> but yeah, it's a, that's a nice memory for me. I, uh, well, 2014 up until this, that had been what I always called the bull market of my career. Uh, you know, and where you basically early in 14, <clears throat> pardon me, you had a, a, a bullish uh, cattle and feed report in April. Uh, started to grind higher into May. Uh, everybody was figuring out we got a wall of cattle coming. We got a lot of calves coming. We just ground higher through May. We got into June. Surely there's more cattle. I didn't think there was. And we just went higher the whole year, basically until October, late October. Um, we also had a bullish report in April. Remember, um, I wish it was easy for me to flip uh, the charts up here and show you the, you know, how there is some real similarities in this year and that year. And of course, the other similarity is the drawdown in supply. I mean, that's what triggered 14, you know, was back to back droughts in 2011 and 2012, massive cow slaughter, blah, blah, blah. Sound familiar? Um, you know, and then the, the beginning of the start of the rebuild uh, of the herd, which holds heifers back, which is when you get into tight supply. So, you know, the the fundamental number nerd in me see some similarities because of the massive liquidation of the breeding stock. And just now starting to finally see some uh, anecdotal, but also some database signs. Um, and we could talk about this for an hour, but I'm starting to see real signs that there is some heifer retention, Susan. Um, and if you look across a weather map, <clears throat> it's raining from Banff, Canada to, to Corpus Christi. Okay. I mean, we have had a lot of moisture all through the grass country, I believe. Maybe there's an exception or two. Somebody will be mad that they missed a rain. But for the most part, I think, you know, we're set up here where the lack of grass or the lack of feed doesn't seem like probably a real great reason to to uh, not see some retention. Now, I get it. For some of these guys, it's still an economic-driven deal, and and, and they, they're telling me, well, I can't afford not to take this price that these guys are willing to give me for a heifer calf. I get it. But there also is that other side of it that if you're going to be a cow guy, <clears throat> you got to have cows, you know. So I, I, I do think that, you know, to think it's way different this time probably is not the correct way to look at it either. Uh, cash, we should be talk about cash because it's been awesome. Well, it definitely is nice to hear the words heifer retention starting to pick up. But unfortunately, with everything that's good, we got to have one um, not so good thing. And you were talking about the weights are still kind of an issue for these cattle right now. Uh, yeah, it's it's a mystery to me, uh, kind of. Um, <clears throat> I thought, you know, as we transitioned out of the yearlings into the new crop cattle, um, that's what I've done in my, you know, and that largely would be the case up in this area, you know, where there's hardly any yearlings left to sell. There shouldn't be either this time of year. And now we're transitioning into a calf, which is a lot lighter. And traditionally, you'd see these typically seasonally, these weights would go down very consistently. And this year they have not. In fact, uh, the data from yesterday had the, the weights only down one pound from a week ago and, and still, let's see, 892 versus one pound above a, a week ago and 25 pounds, I believe, over a year ago. Doing quick math in my head, uh, 35 pounds over a year ago. No, 25. I apologize. 25 pounds over a year ago, carcass weight. Um, so why? You know, I mean, the part of this thing is, is, a, is a function, I think, of... Uh, of what the market does to manage supply. When there's less numbers, we still need to have a certain amount of production so we can increase beef production by making them bigger. Um, some of it's maybe because uh, replacement cattle are awfully high priced, but I really think the, the biggest reason still for me is that from the middle of February on, we've had nearly perfect growing weather. You know, we had really no mud issue this spring in March and April. And, and so I think, we're, you know, we're, we're benefiting from a exceptionally efficient gain here and maybe that's still part of it, but but again, I, I have a hard time explaining it. I would have thought that, I mean, I mean, we're getting 190, 191. Uh, why wouldn't people be selling cattle? And, and I think they are. All right. We always, always appreciate your conversation, Brad, and, and your thoughts on the market. What's the best place for folks to get a hold of you to further talk some more? Uh, the phone number is 712-722-0023 or, or, or pick us up on kkvtrading.com. Thanks for having Bye. me.
Thank you. I can tell you that hat looks pretty dapper on you. <laughs> Just a quick reminder, commodity futures and options do involve a substantial risk of loss. And that has been this week's Cattle Call on the Rural Radio Network.